I've always been a bit of a, uh, I'm a, I'm a recovering uh, packaholic. You know, I, uh, I've always had a hard time going on vacation and just taking way too many things. Can we be honest? I'm a recovering packaholic. Anybody else? Anybody else? You, you, you go and you're packing for a trip. Anybody? I, I always pack the night before I leave. Anybody? Just a procrastinator. We can be honest. There's grace. You know, when we moved, this was really bad. We moved, we sold our house, everything. We moved, I packed up our house the day before we had to move out. Bad idea. Don't do that. I'm a recovering packaholic. You know, I'm going on an overnight trip and I say, I need to take my whole wardrobe. I gotta fit everything. I need options, baby. You know what I'm saying? We're going on, I'm going camping. I need, I need to bring some, I need options, right? Yeah. Going to the beach for a summer holiday, I need to bring five pairs of sweats because just in case, right? We need, we need options. We tend to fill our, our luggage up with a lot of things, don't we? We tend to fill up our bags with a, a lot of things. And, you know, it got me thinking that you know, even going on trips, I get really anxious, not because of Chantel, not because my wife's going to pack too much. It's because I'm going to pack too much. <laughs> I get really anxious because, you know, I tend to fill every nook and cranny with things that I just don't need. Anybody gone on a holiday and you, I'm going to do this, I'm going to wear this, I'm going to read this book, I promise, right? And you just, you don't do it. You just, you go and you buy more things and then you don't even have room for the things that you brought. And it's just a mess, I'm a packaholic. I don't know if anybody else, like, what's a packaholic? I made it up. It sounded good in my head. I need options. I need options. You know, my friends, I, I, I have to tell you that where God wants to take you, it's going to require you to let go of some things. And there's maybe some, some weight that you're carrying around, maybe some things that no one can see. But maybe there's some things that you're holding on to that are just taking up some space. You know, if you go on a trip, if your bag's full of things, you, you don't have any room for souvenirs, do you? You don't have any room for anything new. Could it be that, that we are holding on to things that we've packed too much into our hearts, if you will? We got too much junk in the trunk that we have some things that we got to let go of as God wants to take us to somewhere new. When we picked up everything, as I alluded to two years ago, moving from Albuquerque, New Mexico, you're like, what's that? I don't know either. I don't know why my parents chose to live there, but we, we were there. God used it. It was great, great city. If you've seen Breaking Bad, which we don't watch that stuff, you know, in the house, we're, we're above reproach, but Breaking Bad, Albuquerque, um, it's legit. It's kind of like that. That's where I'm, I, I'm, I'm from. I, I live there. When we packed up our lives to move from Albuquerque to Australia, I had a choice. I could either pay like six grand and get some shipping container and take all my stuff over here. I could just say, you know what? I'm just going to get rid of everything. <laughs> 25 years of my life. All my kids' toys, clothing, uh, books. You know, uh, study materials, portraits, paintings, everything we owned, we ended up getting rid of it. And I really felt like God was telling me in the moment that, Cody, where I want to take you, it's going to require you to let go of some things. You want to try and take all this stuff with you, but what if there's no use for it? What if it's just going to hold you back? What if it's not going to add any benefit to your life, what if there's things that you're holding on to that, man, it's time to let go of? So we packed up our lives into six duffel bags. <laughs> Two kids at the time. You know, my wife's great. She's a minimalist. I'm like, I need options, right? I got, you know, color-coded, and I have way too many shoes. I'm trying to wear them all. I got favorites, you know, anybody, you're like, I'm never going to wear these, but they look cool in my closet, you know. But Chantel was, was easy, you know, and, and, and great. But I, I, I brought stuff that I just, I, I didn't wear, and I tried to pack everything, y'all. Like, please be under 32 kilos. Like, please, right, right? Doing chest compressions on it, trying to, you know, just pack everything in there. But 
everything I owned was packed into six duffel bags. And getting here, I have to tell you, we arrived here in Australia just with this word from God and really in this new season, in this new era of our life, and we didn't have anything. We didn't have anything to furnish our home. We didn't have any toys for our kids. We didn't have hardly anything, just what we could fit in the six duffel bags. But when I got here, I I, I really want to really speak to you guys from this place, and we're going to go to the Word of God in a moment, but really want to set up this night, this series, really to tell you guys that there are some things that you are carrying. There are some things that are hiding away. Maybe you're not even aware of hiding away in the luggage of your heart, so to speak, that you got some junk in the trunk, y'all, that God wants to take you to somewhere better, somewhere new, but it's going to require you to let go of some things. It's going to require you to let go of some things. Friend, I want to tell you that God wants to take you to more. He wants to take you to more. Like, what is more? Is it higher pay rise and a platform and influence and the spouse I've been praying for? Man, I've been getting my nails did every day. You know, I'm just, is that the more he's wanting to do in my life? We, we like to think, don't we, about things that God wants to do through us, don't we? But I want to tell you, my friends, that this series isn't necessarily about what God wants to do through you. It's more so what God wants to do in you. That God wants to do a great work in you. That God wants to take you to more, a greater depth of greater trust, greater dependency, greater intimacy with God, this communion, this relationship with him. God wants to take you to more. 2 Peter 3.18 says this, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. John 15.1, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser, Jesus says. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more. Somebody say more. More fruit. Y'all, I believe that God has a great plan for your life. I believe that with all of my heart. I believe that's, that's biblical, that God has something great he wants to do through you, that God wants to use you in mighty ways, that God wants to bless you. I think it's another time for another message, but what, what does that blessing look like? Do we all think it's just physical, financial? What if it's, it's, it's a greater depth and peace and joy? And, man, I'm not bound to those things anymore, and I, I ha- I'm not people-pleasing, and I'm not angry, and I'm not doubting. What if... There's more that God wants to do in your life, my friend. I really believe that he has something great for you. And I pray that you believe that as well. That is, as I said in that prayer, that that other religions have gods, but Christianity has a father. That you are his son, you are his daughter. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, that is who you are. If you are not a believer in Jesus Christ, there is an invitation to become a son or a daughter. But there is more he wants to do. It's not just through you, it's in you. So I believe God, yeah, some of y'all in this place, God will take you to great places. I believe God has great influence for some of you. God has a place for you to use your gifts in in an avenue that's going to bring him a lot of glory and bring a lot of people to him. Don't forget, whatever you do is for the glory of God and the good of humanity. It's not for us, not for us, not for us. I believe God wants to do something great through you. But first, y'all, he's got to do something deep in us. So God, where God wants to take you requires you to let go of some things. Some things, y'all, some things. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 8. I believe we have this for you on the screens. I'm just setting up this series here, y'all. We're going to dive in in just a moment. But I want us to read this. This is important. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3 through 8. This is the will of God. For the Christian, this is the will. This is God's plan, intent for your life. Your sanctification. Your sanctification. Paul goes on to list some things that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to control your own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion like the unbelievers who do not know God, that one transgress and wrong his brother. He says, God has not called us to impurity, but to holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this doesn't disregard man, but disregards God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. 
It's a lot to unpack there, but simply, I want to tell you that the will of God for your life, Christian, is to sanctify you. It's two things you need to know. I hope, I hope you bought a notebook. I hope you got your phones out. Write some notes, y'all. This is, this is important things. This is life-changing things for you to comprehend, to understand. If it's like drinking from a fire hose tonight, it's okay. We'll, we'll post this message again. Go back, listen. Listen to it on half speed. Yeah, Jesus. <laughs> Oh, man. I'm out of jokes. There's always that moment. Do I keep going? Do I not? I didn't. Okay. Salvation is a one-time event. Somebody tell me salvation. Say that. Salvation. Salvation Salvation is a one-time event. Jesus, I repent. That word means to turn, to turn your mind, to change your mind. You repent. Jesus, forgive me of my shortcomings. The word is sin. Sin means to miss God's standard, to fall short, to miss the mark. Forgive me. I put my trust in you. I believe you're God. I believe you died on the cross. You rose again, that you are alive and eternal, defeating death and sin upon the cross, that I'm your son. It's a one-time event. You're clean. You're saved. You're healed. New heart. New name. Written Names written in the book of life. You received the Holy Spirit, brought into the family of God. It's a one-time event. Salvation, one time, but somebody say sanctification. Sanctification, Sanctification, which some of y'all may not know about. Sanctification is the daily process of being made more like Jesus. So Jesus doesn't just catch the fish. He cleans the fish. So see, when we are saved, hear me, my friend, when we are saved, we are free from the penalty and the power of sin. So we missed the mark. There's a debt. Jesus is called the propitiation, right? The theological term, the the sacrifice, sacrificial uh, atonement that he would take our place to pay that payment that we deserve. That we are free from the penalty. We're free from the power, y'all. I got to tell you, you're you're a, a son, you're a daughter, you're a saint in the house. Sin has no power over you. Death has no power. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? There's no power. So we are free from the penalty and the power of sin, but we are constantly fighting the presence of sin. So until you die, until I die and go be with Jesus, or until he returns, we are fighting, battling the presence of sin. That's why daily it's, Lord, sanctify me. Lord, would you cleanse me? Lord, would you refine me? Would you forgive me? It's this daily process. This is the will of God that he would sanctify you. Ephesians chapter 4, the message translation says this. Paul goes on to say, hey, I don't want any prolonged infancies among you, please. We'll not tolerate babes in the woods, small children who are easy prey for predators. God wants us to grow up. God wants you to grow up, my friends. He wants you to go from drinking milk to eating meat, able to digest the truth of the word of God. That we are not... Easy prey, we're not babies in the faith, but we would grow up. We would grow up. So no matter where you are in your faith journey, this isn't like a, you're a baby, and ah, it's more like God wants to grow you. God wants to take you to more. That God wants to take you somewhere, but there are some things, y'all, that you got to let go of. There's some things that are holding you down, that are weighing you down. What's in the trunk? (laughs) You got some junk? You got some things that are holding you back, that are keeping you from going forward in this relationship with God. He says this, the old way has to go. The old way has to go. God wants to take you somewhere great, my friend. So here it is. He says this, verse 17, I insist, God backs me up on this. So it's not just me, it's God, that there be no going along with the crowd. They've refused so long to deal with God that they've lost touch, not only with God, but reality itself. They can't think straight anymore. He goes on to say they give themselves away. They they dive into these passions of the flesh. He says, but that's no life for you. You learn Christ. God wants to grow you up, my friends. God wants to take you to a greater place, but he wants to do something in you. So I pray that as we spend the next four weeks going through this series, what you can't bring with you, that we would lean into this, that we would say, all right, God, I believe it's it's a stake in the ground moment. That no matter if you're in this place, you know Jesus, you've been walking with him. I gotta tell you, friends, he still wants to do something in you. 
whether you're just beginning, whether you're here and you're like, I don't really know what this is, friend, there's an invitation to more. It's an invitation to freedom, an invitation to joy, an invitation to peace, an invitation to a life that is far beyond anything you could ask, think, or imagine, from an eternity that is spent with God, not one spent without him. God wants to grow you, my friend. You know, God took us out of Egypt, right? We sang about it. You, you took us out of Egypt. You took us out of our bondage. But my friends, God wants to not just take us out of Egypt. He wants to take the Egypt out of us. He wants to take the Egypt out of us. That we've been in this place for too long. Maybe we've even grown complacent in the church. Maybe as Christians, we've become complacent. And we got some things that are holding us back. We got some things that we need to let go of. So you know the, the problem with overpacking is that you don't have any, any more room. You don't have any more room for what God wants to deposit in your life. So what if right now we could just metaphorically speaking, what if we could just check our bags to say, all right, I've been carrying these things. Perhaps you can identify like, oh, man, we haven't even started yet, but I got a list. I, got, I, I don't have one bag. I got 10. <laughs> perhaps you identify. Perhaps you're like, I think I'm good. What if we could just make a decision as a church, and no matter what church you come from, I'm glad you're here. If you're from any other church in this city, any other house, I'm so glad you're here. So this is not just, I believe, to tribes and our church. And if you call us home and you are under our leadership, under our covering, this is for us, y'all. This is where we're going. We are going to check our bags. We're going to pursue sanctification. We're going to let God do a deep work in us. I pray that if you are a Christian, you are just visiting, that you make that decision as well. That you say, all right, Lord, I'm going to lean in. Four weeks, man, I, I could spend a lifetime, but let's do four weeks. Let, let, let's look at the junk that is in the trunk, y'all. Let's give it to Jesus. Y'all with me? What you can't bring with you. Somebody say that. What you can't bring with you. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, you can't bring this with you. I love it. It's, I love it. You're like, the first one was real robust, and then the second was like, oh. oh. I love it. What you can't bring with you. First week. Y'all ready? Here's what we're talking about. I hope you're ready because we're going here. What, first thing we're talking about is this. What you cannot bring with you is the fear of man. Woo! All right. I got to tell you, I was studying and I'm like, sheesh. Because, you know, I got to eat it before I, I, I share it. But, oh, Jesus, I'm sorry, right? But, Fear of man, y'all, we cannot bring this with us. So if you have your Bibles, open up to Galatians chapter 1. We're going to be going through verses 1 through 17. Got it for you on the screens. But I want to just share briefly, uh, just set up some context. Galatians is written by this man named Paul. We're going to understand a little bit more of his story in just a moment. But Paul, uh, he's uh, an apostle, which means that he... Uh, Witness the resurrected Christ, that, that Jesus appears to him, that he's been called by God, that he's a pillar he plants and oversees churches. He receives revelation from God. He sets the course of the, the spiritual climate within the church. So if you're a Christian, Paul's like, he, he's, he's like the guy. Jesus is the goat, but, but Paul's like the guy, right? Like, there's no one like Jesus, but Paul, man, Paul is, is, is pretty great. He's a great leader, great example. And so Paul is writing this letter. He writes this letter to the churches in Galatia. Galatia was a region. So he has his epistles, right? Thessalonians, Colossians, Ephesians, Corinthians, all these, you know, different, just letters. He's just writing these letters to these churches. So like, hey guys, you're doing a good job, but here's what you need to work on. Or here's what God's telling me to tell you. So he's writing Galatians to the churches in this area, in this region. So all of his epistles, this is, this is just a little fun, fun side note. All of his letters, he starts out by giving them a greeting. So, hey, it's Paul, a bond servant in Christ, apostle called by God to preach the gospel. It's just, here's who I am, here's what I do, here's who called me. 
then he usually gives them like an encouragement. To the church in Thessalonica, I just want to say, great job. and God is so proud of you and keep going. But hey, there's some things we need to work on. To the, Gal the church in Galatia, he just starts off by saying this. He greets them. He says, this, let's read verse 1. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. And all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Here I am. Here's who I am. No, sorry, not here. I, hey, here I am. I'm Paul. He's just saying, making his statement. God called me. God chose me. It's not man who put me here. It's God himself. To the churches. Verse 3. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So this welcoming, this welcoming. But notice the next verse. It's not like, great job, guys. He says this, verse 6. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, verse 7, but there are some who trouble and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be cursed. As we have said before, now I say again, just in case you didn't catch it the first time, y'all, if you're preaching another gospel, he says, let him be cursed. Let him be cursed. Verse 10 says this, For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, catch this, I would not be a servant of Christ. Here's a word tonight, y'all. If you're taking notes, write this down. But what will they say? <laughs> but what will they say? What you can't bring with you, the fear of man, week one. But what will they say? Growing up in a big family, it meant two things. Lots of emotions and a pretty tight budget. <laughs> I grew up not wearing name brands. We were not a name brand family. Anybody else? Like, you, 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 you know, everyone's a name brand. Wow, I guess Perth does have the most millionaires per capita. So y'all are, y'all are, 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 but... Maybe the Americans in the place, right? <laughs> no, we weren't a name brand family. My parents just, I don't know why. We didn't have name brand toys, name brand shoes. Even our food wasn't name brand. <laughs> but I got to tell you, man, knockoff like food is actually pretty fire. It's great. It was great. Tom's nodding in the back. Amen. Preach it. All right. Challenge. Let's all get not name brand stuff. What? Okay. You don't like that. But I wasn't a name brand family. You know, I grew up skateboarding. I still uh, try to skateboard. I love it. If you skate, hit me up. Let's go. We do a little skate and, you know, shredding and spreading. Just, you know, <laughs> pray for people and pray for them. Spread the gospel and skate. You know, we're, we're doing it. Skaters for Christ. <laughs> Hashtag shred, you know. <laughs> but I grew up skateboarding and... Um, before, before I, got, I got sponsored, I, I didn't have any, like, name brand stuff. So even, like, my shoes, they weren't name brand. I would just kind of duct tape them and, you know, just make them last, you know. And, and uh, skateboards were just kind of, like, knock off. They would crack really easily. And I'm just, that's all I knew. I was fine with it. It wasn't until I started getting into, you know, social circles and people were like, look at his shoes or look at what he's wearing. I got to tell you, y'all, I was wearing Fila and Champion before they were hot. If y'all remember, in the 90s, they were not hot. That was like, man, this, you, were, you were on a tight budget. You get some champion on you, you know. <laughs> but it wasn't until other people started to point out what I was wearing that I started to think, oh, am I not cool? You know, because I don't have the name brand skate shoes, does that mean I'm not a good skateboarder, right? I'm just this young cat, but... People are starting to point things out, and it wasn't until people started to say things about what I was not wearing or what I was not doing that I started to 
start to think, well, man, maybe I should try and change how I live and change what I do so that way I won't be teased or I will think that I'm, they'll think that I'm cool or they'll want to include me. I don't know if y'all have been through something similar, maybe an event, maybe it's just something you've seen, but maybe you've lived a lot of your life carrying the fear of man in your luggage. That you feel like I got to even, man, I think this looks really dope, so I'm pretty proud of this. We thrifted this. <laughs> Be like, man, I got to have, have the Louis bag, man. You know, when I'm on the plane, people got to, I got to know. They got to know who's sitting next to them. I'm not in business because I bought this bag, but it's okay. <laughs> they, they're going to learn today who I am, right? We feel this constant need to have to try and prove to people that we're something, don't we? That we got to prove to them that we're valuable or that we're worthy. And I, I mean, fill in the blank. I, I wonder how many of us would admit in this moment, we'd admit that, man, I, I actually have the fear of man in my life. Maybe you recognize it. Maybe it's something you've been praying through and Lord help me. Or maybe it's just something that is going to be revealed to you now. I mean, I think if we're all being honest, we all got the hooks of this in our flesh. We all got the hooks. So it's, a, it's pulling us back. We want to go, for, we want to live a life for Christ. We want to step out in faith. But what will they say? But what, what are they going to say about me? What are they going to say? I, I want to pursue, I feel this wrestle. Some of y'all feel this struggle of, I want to pursue Jesus and live a life with Jesus uh, publicly. <laughs> It's easy to do it privately, but to live it publicly, but what will they say? What will they say? What will they say? You know, this isn't just something my friends that uh, extroverted type A personalities struggle with. It's not just something that those who are, you know, uh, uh, excited and energetic and who can carry a conversation, it's not just those types of personalities that struggle with the fear of man, it's also the, the wallflowers. It's also those who are a bit more reserved. I think if we're being honest, perhaps we all struggle with this maybe more than we think. So the fear of man, if you don't know what it is, it's, it's simply just allowing humanity to give you worth, allowing humanity to give you approval. And not just allowing them to do that, but actively seeking that from them. So here's how to know if you have the fear of man in your heart. Do you constantly find yourself looking to people for approval? What do you think? Should I post this? Should I wear this? Should I eat this? Am I good enough? Do you, do, was that good? Can you, or do we constantly find ourselves trying to get approval from people? Do we constantly maybe feel like we got to be the best dressed in, in an environment so we can be complimented, so we can be noticed? I mean, can we just be honest? Do we find ourselves constantly trying to get into maybe spaces? We have this fear of missing out because if we're not there, then maybe we won't feel valuable or, 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 or worthy or included or loved that Man, they, they didn't invite me, so they must not care about me, which mean, must mean that I'm not good enough and I'm not worth anything. And I knew I should have, you know, gone to their birthday party last year, but I didn't. And now they hate me. And now it's, you know what I mean? It's this constant cycle of just what will they say? What are they thinking? First thing, if you're taking notes, my friends, I want you to write this down. We've got three questions to ask ourselves tonight. The first thing is this, who do I fear? Who do I fear? But what will they say? I want to pursue you, Jesus, but what will they say? Are we caught in this hamster wheel of just needing approval, <laughs> needing the acceptance, needing the affirmation? See, friend, I believe that, that wanting that, desiring that isn't necessarily bad, but what's bad, the problem we run into is from whom we're trying to get that from. We're trying to get it from man. We're trying to get it from our friend. We're trying to get it from Instagram. We're trying to get it from Twitter. We're trying to get it from, does anybody use Twitter anymore? I don't know. 
We're trying to get it from X, Y, and Z, but we're constantly trying to find worth, constantly trying to find approval. Who do you fear? Who do you fear? Proverbs 29, 25 says, fearing people is a dangerous trap, but trusting the Lord means safety. Fearing people, is, it's a trap. It's, it's dangerous. You want to be safe? Man, fear the Lord. Trust the Lord. Trust the Lord. Who do you fear tonight, my friends? Paul gives this incredibly dense, incredibly rich statement. It's not just a declaration that sounds good. He's lived this, y'all. This is a lifetime of suffering for Christ and being refined and being thrown in jail and beaten and yet still pressing on. Yet I'm gonna rejoice in my trial. We talked about the wilderness last week, that man, I'm getting stronger. You can say all you want, but I'm gonna pursue Jesus because he's doing a great work in me. It's, 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 it's my sanctification. I'm not worried about what you're gonna do through me, God. I wanna worry about what you, you wanna do in me. He makes this statement. He says this, am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Am I trying to please man? I don't know if you noticed the language. He says, if I were, what? Still trying. If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. There's so much here, y'all. I just feel led to encourage some of you. That word still. And he says, if I were still trying, if I was still that way, I would not be a servant. I got to tell you, my friends, what you're carrying right now doesn't have to be what you walk through forever. I'm struggling with this fear of man and it's weighing me down, but could it go from this is really heavy to just, oh, this is, this is light. You know, Jesus says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. You know, what if we could go into this next sort of frontier? Not like, oh gosh, this is tough, right? But what are like, all right, God, let's go. I got this, this freshness. I got space for you to deposit things in my heart that God, I know you want to take me somewhere. And I'm leaning in. I am down. I am okay with it. Wilderness, refinement, persecution, that's what I signed up for. I don't know if you're a Christian in the place, you signed up for just blessing and green pastures and all these great things, and you're like, whoa, did I get something wrong? My friends, I got to tell you, that will come but there are also troubles that you will walk through. So I'm not up here to tell you it's all going to be great because, man, it's going to be hard. But God wants to take you to more, wants to take you to more, more trust, more dependence, more blessing, more intimacy, more joy, more peace, more freedom, more, 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 more. Not just to leave you stuck with this fear of, man, can I ever be free? <laughs> Who do you who do you fear? Paul brings up this incredible statement and, and shows us really the sharp contrast that either you can serve man or you can serve God. That you can fear man or you can fear God. So if you fear man, right, you're constantly searching for approval. You're constantly thinking about what they're going to say about you. You're, you're calculating your steps before you take them. All right, if I post this, then maybe this person will say that, so maybe I shouldn't post that. But if, if I wear this, they're going to say that, but they're going to say, wow, that's really expensive. Should you be wearing that? She's like, okay, well, I don't want any confrontation. I just, I don't want any smoke. So I'm just going to, you know, bow before whatever is in the moment. And yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be one way to you so I can please you. And then I'm going to be another way over here so I can please you. And then I'm just going to go and go and try to please and find approval. And you're just exhausted. The more you try and please people, the more you're going to find. It's not only exhausting, but it's impossible. You cannot please everyone. So what if we're wasting time spinning our wheels, fearing man when we should be fearing God? Do you give in to peer pressure? 
Do you have a need for recognition? Do you fear criticism? Do you fear humiliation? I think this is a big one for some of y'all. Do you constantly try that all, all you can in every situation, you want to have control because you are deeply afraid of being embarrassed? But what if I'm in, what if I look like this? Or what if that? Or what if they catch me on my bad side, right? Like I, I'm just so afraid of being embarrassed. I wonder how many of us, if we're being really honest, are embarrassed to follow Jesus. That we're, we're, we're embarrassed. We're embarrassed to pray for someone in public. We're embarrassed maybe to invite our friends to church in front of our other coworker that we know that they, we're, we're wondering if they think I'm cool. Are they gonna invite me out to, to do whatever? Fill in the blank. We're, we're, we're embarrassed, so we're picking and choosing in the moment. Hey, man, I just got to tell you, um, real quick, Jesus loves you. Okay, bye. What? <laughs> hey, can I pray? Yeah, Jesus, I just prayed that you're blessed. Okay, say uh, what? I'm getting a phone call. <laughs> yeah, what's up? Oh, yeah, okay, we're going to hit the gym later. Okay, bye. Right? It's like, it's your mom. She's like, your laundry's done. <laughs> so, yeah, okay. Are, are we embarrassed? Are we just constantly, like, living in this space where we are fearing, man, we're fearing criticism. We're fearing what they're going to say. Well, but what would they say? You know, when we talk about it, it's almost like kind of comical, right? It's like, I don't do that. <laughs> Surely not. But the first step, my friends, to letting the Lord heal, to letting the Lord step into this place, the first step to let go of what you've been carrying is just to admit it. <laughs> Just to recognize that, oh my gosh, I have the fear of man. You don't got to raise your hand, but any light bulbs in the place? Just like, whoa, I may, I may be struggling with this. I may have this in my luggage. Who do you fear? Who do you fear? So there's a contrast. We either fear man or we fear God. Jesus says you can't serve two masters. Joshua says this, choose whom you will serve this day. He says, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going we're gonna to fear the Lord. To fear the Lord, my friends, simply means that you are walking in this awe, in this reverence, in this deep respect of Almighty God. It's not this like, oh, I'm afraid. It's just God. You are, wow. You're, you're eternal and mighty, and you've spoken. Everything was created. And, and you changed my life. I, I was once that way, but now I'm not. Like, you, you did that for me. You did that for my mom, my brother, my cousin. You did that for fill in the blank. That It's this almighty reverence. It's this respect. There's a great temptation, Christian. I want, I want you to listen. There's a great temptation that we face to be, re, to be relevant, but to be irreverent. To be, yeah, dope with culture, man, and down with it. And yeah, I'm, I'm wearing, I mean, all the, you know, I don't even know, guys. Someone got some sneakers the other day. I don't even know what they're called. I'm like, those look really cool. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, what are we filling in with these, with these things, with these culture, with these statements, with these, these ideologies and these, these theories or these even beliefs now? It's like there's this buzz right now, like let's hate on the church. Let's call out the church. And I believe, y'all, it's not call out culture. It's call up culture. Hey, church, remember, you're the bride of Christ. You're the hope of the world. Let's pursue Jesus. Just because humanity messes up, y'all, doesn't mean that God is a bad God. Just because they messed up, just because that church did that, doesn't mean that the church is evil. It means that humanity is evil and we need Jesus. My goodness. Don't be tempted to be relevant in culture and be irreverent to God. Because you are bowing before the world. You are bowing before man and turning your heart away from God. We got to talk about this. It's sanctification. It's God, what do you want to do in me? So Paul is saying, do I fear man? Am I trying to please man or am I trying to please God? Do I fear God? Am I walking in submission, in reverence, in respect to Almighty God? It doesn't mean you're perfect. Doesn't mean you check, you check every box. It just means that, God, my eyes are on you. Lord, my, my desire is you. I'm fearing you. Paul says this. I'm so astonished. Remember, not like a great job. 
I'm praying for you. He says, y'all, I'm shocked that you've so quickly turned from the true gospel. I'm like amazed that you would leave the trueness of what God has said. Uh, I'm amazed that you have turned to a, another gospel, he says, which actually isn't even a gospel at all. Now, I think it's important, my friends, that we, we ask ourselves this, why? Why am I living with, for the fear of man? Why am I living for man's approval? Why is that hook so deep in my flesh? Why do I feel so drawn and stuck? And why do I feel like with everything I do, I'm just under a magnifying glass and I just feel exhausted and I'm tired, man. I'm broke because I'm just buying all these things that I hope will give me worth. I hope will give me value. I'm trying to do all these things that I think that boy or that girl, I think they like. So that way they might like me and, you know, and, I think that the issue is that we equate approval with value. So we think that, Ezra, if you, if you like me, man, if, if you're, if you're going to, like, applaud my leadership and if you're going to be, like, excited about what I'm doing and I'm looking you know, to, to my team and I'm looking like, do you guys like what I'm doing? Am I a good leader? Then I'm equating your approval with my value. Because what I'm saying is I'm literally giving you the keys. I'm saying, all right, man, here's the keys to everything. You didn't take them. That's good. That's good. You didn't take them. It's a test. <laughs> but I'm literally saying, hey, man, I'm giving, or ma'am, or whoever, I'm giving you the power to tell me who I am and who I'm not. Uh, American artist Lecrae says this. He says that if you live for their approval, you'll die from their rejection. Bars. <laughs> That's fire. That if I'm living for your approval and all of a sudden you don't like me anymore, then I'm going to die from your rejection. Ask yourself, who do I fear? Who do I fear? Who do I fear? Who do I fear? But what will they say? Are we afraid of being rejected? Are we afraid of being canceled? Are we afraid of, you know, being shunned and Pushed aside, man, I, I got to tell you, I'm not going to stand before my best friend one day. I'm not going to stand before social media. I'm going to stand before God. I'm not going to stand before my team or any of you. My heart's to lead you well, to give you the fullness of Jesus and to be above reproach and to be an example and to stay faithful to my wife and to be a good father and to, to point you to Jesus always. But I'm not going to stand in front of you. I'm going to stand in front of God. I'm going to stand before him. What if, what if where God wants to take us, it requires us to first off recognize that I'm fearing not you, God. I'm actually fearing man. And not to just recognize it, but to then to say, all right, here it is. <laughs> can you do something with this? I, I think you can, my friends. But what will they say? But what will they say? First thing is this. Do I want to be popular or faithful? Do I want to be popular or faithful? Right, Paul says, I'm just going to read it quickly again. I'm so astonished that you've so quickly deserted the gospel. You're going to another one. It's not even a real gospel. If anyone's preaching another one, be cursed. Am I now seeking to approve for the approval of man or of God, am I still trying to please man? If I was still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. You know, one thing I like to say just over, over the years of leadership, and you may, maybe you've heard it, I, don't, I didn't make it up, but um, it goes like this, is our, our methods always change, but our message never does. So how we get the gospel to people may change. It's maybe using social media or word of mouth or visual arts or the creative medium. The method changes, but the message never does. I don't know if you know this, my friends, but you never graduate past the gospel. There's nothing higher. <laughs> it's, it's the gospel. Jesus Christ, God, 
dead, buried, raised to life. Resurrected power, salvation, forgiveness. That, that's why we're here. That's, what I, that's why I moved here to tell you, to tell this city. It's, we never graduate past the gospel. But there's a temptation we face in our society to not change the methods, but to change the message. So yeah, Jesus loves you and you can live however you want. You know, all, all I've come to find out, actually, um, all roads lead to God. You know, God is just what you want it to be. You know, right now there's a lot of, you know, deconstruction and wokeness and all these things of like, man, you know what? I can actually live how I want and still love Jesus. It's, it's wanting both. You want to make your cake and you want to eat it too. It's, it's both, it's both, it's both. But my friends, do not buy into that temptation. The message does not change. Paul is saying, I am so astonished that you are going from the true gospel to nothing. You're going from the trueness of Jesus Christ, the gospel, and you are throwing that away, pursuing nothing. I'm not here to tell you that being popular is, is bad, but it is a point because it reveals what our motive is. Do I want to be liked by man? Do I want to be pleased by man? Do I want to have a platform before man? Do I want to get the followers and the likes and the influence and the money or whatever it is that you're believing or dreaming or you desire? Do, you, do we want that or do we want to be faithful to God? Could it be that the motive is Jesus? It's you first. Jesus, I'm pursuing you. And perhaps all that stuff will be added afterwards. You know, Jesus, doesn't he say, I believe Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all will be added unto you. If it's the will of God, it's gonna happen. But what's our motive? What's our motive? Do we wanna be liked by man or do we wanna be approved by God? Eleanor Roosevelt said this, you wouldn't think so much, sorry, you wouldn't worry so much about what others think of you if you realized how seldom they do. <laughs> What will they say? What are they thinking? They're thinking about tacos. <laughs> they're thinking about what they're going to do after tribes. You know, it's like, they're not thinking of you. Could we be just spinning our wheels, y'all? What's our motive? What's our motive? You know, it's important because we need to understand motive is, is very important. Motive is very crucial motive is the driving force behind why we do what we do. You know, it, it's actually heartbreaking for me to read this. John chapter 12, verse 42 through 43 says this, nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, many of the, the elite people in the society, many of them believed in Jesus. But for fear of man, but for the fear of man, they did not confess it. For they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. They saw Jesus heal and speak and open blind eyes and heal lepers to go where no one would go to touch the, the dirty and the unclean, to bring them in, to, to go into love and to serve, that he's speaking that I am the Messiah, that look at what, look at the, the kingdom of God is here. They believed, but they would not confess it. Why? Because they feared man. Because they feared that if I confess it, I'm gonna lose my place in society. If I confess that Jesus is Lord, I'm gonna lose my, my status. I'm gonna lose my friend group. I'm gonna, I'm gonna lose the opportunity. I'm gonna lose prestige in their eyes. You know what I say to that? So be it. Let me lose it. You know, the, 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 the disciples, Jesus is talking to them and all the, he talks about the cost and communion and the disciples, all these people leave. And the 12 are there and Jesus says, are you gonna go too? Peter says this, where else are we gonna go? You're it. 
Jesus, you're, you're the Messiah. You're the one we've been waiting for, that all of Scripture has been pointing to, that all of creation has longed for. The only solution to humanity's problem ever. He came. Where, where else are we going to go? Let, let us lose prestige. Let us lose honor in their eyes. I, I want your honor, God. I want your glory, not the glory of man. You know, receiving the glory of man is like getting a trophy. Looks good, shiny, but it decays, doesn't it? It, it rusts. It's not eternal. But receiving the glory of God is, Revelation talks talks about a crown that all of the elders that all we're going to lay our crowns down before God that God has prepared crowns for us that he has rewards for us in heaven and we're going to give it right back to him I, I want to tell you my friend I want a crown not a trophy I don't want these these temporary things I don't want to just come here and build tribes to be this big thing and it's amazing and exciting and growing I want to be faithful to God I don't want to be popular in this city. But I want to be faithful to God. That, that's my heart. I pray that we can just examine, what am I carrying? What do, what do I got here? I, I want to be faithful. I want to be faithful. And if you so choose to increase my life in whatever capacity, God, I'm first faithful to you. I'm first faithful to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, Whatever you do, fashion, business, skateboarding, music, art, well, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Whatever you do, somebody say, whatever I do, do it for the glory of God. Whatever you do, y'all, do it for the glory of God. Our motive should be to glorify God. Applause is going to fade. The crowd's going to leave. But God, it's, he's eternal. He's it's a crown, not a trophy, y'all. A crown, not a trophy. <clears throat> Pleasing God and living for God doesn't mean that we don't love people. It just means that we live to please God and love people. <laughs> We, we're, we're here to, to please God, to glorify God, not man, not man. Who do you fear? What's your motive? But what will they say? Are we worried that we're going to lose things because of the fear of man? Last thing is this, y'all want to invite Riley up. Last thing is this, but what did he say? But what did he say? Who do you fear? Do you want to be popular or faithful? And last thing is this, but what did he say? Galatians chapter 1, verse 11, Paul goes on to say this, For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. He says, what I'm telling you, it's not, man, it's not man made. It's God made and it's God sent. He says, I had a direct revelation with Jesus, meaning that Jesus himself told me this gospel. That Jesus himself told me. Paul goes on to say, I'm just going to truncate it just for the sake of time. He says, You've heard of my former life. I was once this way. He says, I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism, in my religion, beyond many of my own age, among my people. I was so extremely zealous for my traditions of my fathers. Verse 15, but when he who set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me, he says, I did not immediately consult with anyone. I didn't receive this message from man. I received it from God. Stop worrying about what they're going to say and worry about what he said. 
about what God has spoken, about what God has given us, y'all. We're at an advantage because we have everything God has said right here. Paul didn't have, I mean, he wrote a third of the New Testament. <laughs> like we, we, we have such an advantage because we don't have to look anywhere else. We've got everything we need right here. Paul says, I received this, but I didn't go to man first. I didn't take this and say, hey, what do you think? Ezra, this, does this sound good to you? What do you think of this? He says, no, 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 I didn't, I didn't take this to man. I, I went to God first. Friend, could it be that we are going to man when we should be going to God? Could it be that a lot of our issues or our struggles or our temptations or issues, we're just making it worse by going to man instead of going to God, just saying, Lord, I, I'm dealing with these things. Will you help me? I'm coming to you first. Some of you have very precious things in your heart. I can feel this, this is for you. You have very precious things, very sacred, very holy things. But there is a wrestle that you have to wanna to take that word to someone else because you want approval. Because you want someone to affirm it, my friend, be careful. You know, the word of God says to not cast your pearls before swine, to not take what's precious and cast it before anything. I'm not saying that older, you know, or, or younger or more mature Christians are pigs. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying just be careful who you take these things to. Could it be that we need to go to God first? God, what did you say? I'm not pursuing a false gospel. I'm not letting culture shape my, my, my gospel. I'm not buying into this notion that I can just live my truth and get you to co-sign on what I want to do. I'm not just living with this notion that I can just pick and choose, go to Subway and yeah, hold, you know, give me the blessing, give me the breakthrough, give me the provision, but hey, hold up, hold that sanctification thing. I don't like that. <laughs> hold the refining, hold the correction, God. I don't want that. Don't give into that notion, y'all. Go to the word of God. What you can't bring with you is the fear of man. Let's stop living with this fear that they're gonna say these things about me, that they're gonna push me out, my friends. Fear God, walk in respect, walk in reverence to God, walk in surrender to God. I don't know if there's anybody in this place that is just tired, you're willing to make a stand and say, all right, Lord, I'm in. I'm willing to stand, I'm willing to, to worry more about what, what you're saying, I'm, I'm willing to get in your word and to actually understand who you are. This isn't some self-help book. This is the written word of God, my friends, that we go to it because it is God's heart. Do you know God's heart? Do you know his plan? Do you know how much he loves you, that he corrects those who he loves? So God wants to take you somewhere, my friends. He wants to take you somewhere great. We gotta let go of the fear of man. <laughs> we gotta let go. When you get on your feet, my friends, I wanna pray for you. <laughs> Y'all ever play that game telephone? Where it's like everybody's in a circle and someone has a message and so the 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 goal is for the person at the end of the circle to then say what the person at the other side said. So someone says like, Jesus loves you in the ear. And then the person is supposed to say, Jesus loves you to the next person. And then the next, the next. And usually by the time it comes around and the person has to say what was said, they're like, Jesus hates you. It's like, that's not what I said. I said, Jesus loves you. Friends, could it be that we are allowing man to shape our view of God, that we're allowing man's voice to distort, to twist God's heart, God's truth, God's character? Everything I'm saying, go do your own research. Go look at the Word of God. I believe I've studied this. I prayed myself empty. I believe that what I've spoken is true. But I encourage you, dive into the Word of God. You hear it. 
Go, go dive in. Go and do a study through this, man. Like, can we just stop being spectators and be participants? Can we just stop being one foot in, one foot out and just say, Lord, I, I, I'm here. God, I want, I want you to, to grow me. I'm, I'm willing to let go of these things. I'm willing to, to let go of some, some junk in the trunk, man. What I can't bring with me is it's a fear, man. And my son, Brixton, he's just learning uh, sentences. He, he speaks real good. <laughs> but I'll tell him, Brixton, you know, and maybe, I don't know, maybe at home I'm tired, I mumble, I don't know, maybe it's me. I'm not saying it's all him. I'm like, hey, Brix, Daddy loves you. He's the cutest thing. He comes up to me, he goes, Daddy? He goes, Daddy, what did you say? Real intent. Daddy, what did you say? <laughs> what did you say? What? And he just keeps saying it and saying it until I tell him what I said. He is just so concerned with knowing what his father said. Daddy, what did you say? There's this desperation in him. You should see his eyes. Daddy, what did you say? And he will not leave me alone until I tell him what I said. For I just feel the spirit of God. What if, what if we could have that same level of desperation? Father, daddy, what did you say? What, what, what did you say? about how I am to live my life? What did you say about who you are? What did you say about who I am? What did you say about your will? Oh, it's sanctification. Oh, it's to fear you and not man. All right, well, I trust that your ways are higher. I trust that your ways are better. I trust that, that your plans are beyond my understanding and I'm just willing to partner with you and to trust you. Father, what did you say? I wonder if that could be our hearts cry tonight. What did you say? What did you say? Not worrying about what will they say, worrying about what God did say. <laughs> Friend, if you're here tonight and you need to let go of this, you need to let go of the fear of man, we're gonna be bold tonight. This isn't for me, this isn't for anyone in this place, this isn't to post a photo. This isn't for anything, my friend, to, other than just to let you have a moment with God. I didn't move all this way, pack my life into six duffel bags just to get an Instagram moment. I came here to, to see the captive set free. I came here to see blind eyes open, to see prodigals return home, to see those who are bound become free, those dead come alive. If you're in this place tonight and you want to give this to the Lord, give him this fear of man to say, Lord, I've, I've got some junk in the trunk. I wanna bring my bag and I wanna put it here at the altar, at your feet. I'm just gonna ask you to be bold. Would you just come up here and stand on this rug? If that's you, I just wanna pray for you. Just come up here. Come on, y'all. Just come. That's all right. Let's go. Let's, let's raise our, our voices. Let's give God some glory. Look at this. We can say, Lord... Take this. I know, y'all, this was me this week. I'm at the feet of the cross saying, Lord, rid me of this. I don't want to hold back my words because I'm afraid that someone's going to criticize me. I'm going to just speak the truth of God. And if I'm persecuted, the Word of God says I'm blessed. If people hate me, man, I'm blessed. If I'm put down because of the name of Jesus, I'm willing to do it. I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. Even as you come and you hear me say that, I do not fear man. Do not fear man's voice. Do not fear what man has to say because God has the final say, my friend. He died for you, they didn't die for you. He shed his blood for you. They didn't shed their blood for anyone. He called you by name. You are here. He created you, intent, design. He loves you. That is the voice we listen to. That is the God we serve. That is the God we look to. If you're here in the front, you came up, would you put your hands out to receive? And it's even just a posture. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a surrender. It's saying, Lord, what is in my hands, I give to you. I'm releasing this. Here's what we're gonna do, friend. I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. I'd love for you just to say this out loud if you believe it, and then I'm gonna pray over you. So don't go anywhere just yet. It's a simple prayer. 
But would you just say, church, let's just declare this over our friends. If you're up here in the front, if you're watching online, just say this out loud. Dear Jesus, I give you this. I don't want to walk in the fear of man. I acknowledge it and I give it to you. I believe that your resurrection power can heal me of this. You can break chains in my life. I pray that your love, your grace, your mercy, your honor, your glory would be far greater to me than anything that this world has to offer. I repent of this and I turn to you. I give you what's in my bag and I receive your forgiveness. I receive your mercy. I receive your grace. I receive your gospel. Help me to live my life for you, for your voice, for your name, and no other. I give you my heart, and I receive your love. In Jesus' name I pray. Father God, I pray for every person up here who has come forward. God, there is a deep work happening. Holy Spirit, you are moving. Lord, you are doing a great thing in this place right now, God. And as we have confessed with our mouths, Lord, as we have given these things to you, this fear of man, Lord, I pray that you would truly break it now, Lord, that it would be broken, Father, that we would not be bound by what they will say or what they would think, God, but we would walk out of this place, Lord, full of peace, full of joy, full of contentment. God, we are not here for a show. We are not here to build an audience. God, we are here to know you, to experience your love, Jesus. And I just pray, Father, over every soul under the sound of my voice, God, that you would do a deep work, Lord, that it would be broken now, Jesus. We pray in, in fullness, God, that it would be broken. Lord, that this chain, this tendency would be no more. God, not even a, a, a glimmer, God, that we would walk out of this place full of faith, full of expectation, God, knowing that we are not bound to fearing man any longer. I pray that when we are tempted to think about what they will say, God, we will think first of what you did for us on the cross. We will think of your mercy, of your grace, God. We will think and ask ourselves, what decision is gonna bring most glory to you? What decision is gonna make me most like you, God? I, I believe it's a, it's a holy moment right now. I thank you for your presence. I thank you for the work on the cross, Lord. I thank you for raising from the dead. And I pray blessing over every person here, God. I pray that, that there would be greater expectation, Lord, that even on night one, week one of this series, Lord, that it would be groundbreaking, monumental for this community, God, particularly for those who have come forward. God, I pray blessing over them. Peace. Peace now, peace now, peace now. Friends, I believe God wants to continue to work, continue to move. If you'd like to go back to your seats, you're welcome to, but I believe take a moment at this altar, talk to God. Maybe there's more that you feel led to release or to speak, or honestly, y'all, just sit in the presence of God. Let his love wash over you. Let his presence not just be around you, but to fill you again, to fill you again. Van, would you lead us in and let's just sing this to the Lord. Let's just thank God. Let's just believe that there is more ahead of us. It's not the end, y'all. It's not, it's not the end. That There is more that God wants to do. 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your freedom. Thank you for your grace. We worship you. Praise you, Father. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Sing worthy. We look to you. Worthy is your name, Jesus. No other name. 